So how have you been, Dev? Yeah, good, good. Had a busy week. Um, yeah. in, uh, I, I'm really fortunate that I work at a university now um, right. and I can work from home quite a bit um, when, I get the, when I get the opportunity. But this week has just been non-stop uh, from half past eight on Monday till what time did I get home to about uh, about quarter past five today. I've just been non-stop, so it's been it's been pretty good, and I'm um, I'm, I'm feeling uh, I'm feeling pretty healthy, so all, all good, mate. Thanks. Good man. So before we get stuck into your rugby story, where was home for a young Dave and who lived at home with you, mate? Home was yeah. um, a, a place just outside of Wigan called Abram. Right. I was growing up when I was a kid. That was um, sort of primary school age. Um, mum and dad, um, and my, my younger sister. Um, so she's 12 months, about 12 months younger than me. Uh, and then we moved to a place called Shevington um, yeah. when we went to high school, uh, which again, another another side of Wigan. Um, so yeah, I'm a, a, I suppose I'm a proper Wiganer. <laughs> Right, mate. So, how was you introduced to rugby, and and where was it that you were introduced to it? There's a, a, a couple of reasons. Um, my mum and dad were, were massive rugby fans. Um, sort of when they were growing up through the sixties and early seventies, they, they they followed the Wigan home and away. Right. Um, before me and my sister uh, came along, so they sort of every time that there was anything on TV. When when we were little, like the earliest memories was watching watching rugby on telly. You know, um, Eddie Waring, it would have been. Um, but my dad took me to my first game, Wigan against Widnes. Um, oh, can it, mate? Uh, isn't it? Yeah. No. yeah. <laughs> um, at Central Park, we, we stood on the cop at Central Park, um, and I, I think I was seven at, at the time. Uh, no idea what was going on. But um, I was hooked from there. It was it was great. Loved it. And did you go on to to play club rugby? And what other sports did you play growing up? Oh well, um, I played. I, I generally played cricket. The reason yeah. I played cricket was because it was right next door. That the, the the cricket pitch was right next door to where my granddad and my grandma lived. I right. um, used to spend loads of time with with uh, with my granddad when um, in um, we were in primary school and what have you. So he took me down because it was just around the corner from where he lived. So I played loads of cricket as a kid, um, but try to try to start playing rugby rugby league um, yeah. when I went to high school. Uh, sorry, when I went to when I went to middle school, there were middle. I mean, it sounds posh that, doesn't it? But uh, <laughs> it does. Yeah, and it definitely wasn't. Um, <laughs> So when I went to middle school, when I was 10, I played rugby there for the first time uh, for the school team. And, and that was brilliant. All, 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 you know, I was the smallest kid on the on the pitch. And so they, they stuck me on the wing and, and I got probably three touches every game that I played. But I loved it. Yeah. Um, but then when we moved and I went to high school, high school didn't play rugby. Um, okay. So we, um, we we ended up playing football. Um, so a, a lot of a lot of stuff during that time was around cricket and football, sort of growing up. But I was sort of the odd one out in our school because not the odd one out because there's a few others, a few other lads that like rugby. But yeah. I was just Monday morning. I was talking about rugby, and the and the rest of the lads were talking about Everton and Liverpool and, and United and City and, and well maybe not City at the time because they were crap, but. Yeah. Um, and, and Wigan Athletic. So that's that that was the sort of vibe that, that we got when we were or what I got when I was a um when I was a youngster. Right. So do you know when you're playing cricket and footy, at what age do you have to decide? Or did you ever have to decide? It yeah, didn't really, because oh. it was um I could play cricket April to April to September and I could play football. Um, Jen, it was at school, really. So it, yeah. it was. It wasn't. Re- it wasn't. It wasn't for a long time at school because. Uh, well, I'll explain that. I'll explain that in a minute. But yeah. it wasn't really choose one or the other. Um, but when I got to, I think it was sixteen. I sort of said, you know what, I'm going to play rugby. Stuff what stuff all my mates. I'm going to play rugby, um, and I did, um, and, and I sort of chose then uh, that I wanted to play rugby. Yeah, um, and that sort of that was my main my main focus, I suppose. Um, 
I still play cricket when we, we weren't we were playing, but we the play. off season sort of yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but we sort of played August August all the way through to April. So we only really got so I only really got a few months uh, a few months of cricket in when I when I got a little bit older. And probably without realising it, Dave, and obviously we'll touch on what you do now and what you have done. Is it are you introducing skills into all the sports you're playing without knowing, benefiting each sport you're in. Yeah, because for, for me, I was never very good at anything sport-wise, but yeah. I just loved doing it. Um, you know, I, I'm not very tall. People that know me know that um, and will get stuck in and get stuck into me for that. Um, but I, I like playing uh, basketball, but was no, you know, no good at it. it was I, I play basketball with, with my mates uh, down the side of the house and, and what have you. Um, then there'd be things like um, I, pl- I play cricket, I play rugby, league, I play rugby, league, play football, uh, play golf because the golf course was just down the road, and I, I borrowed some uh, golf clubs off off a mate, and so I had a go at everything. I enjoyed yeah. doing loads of different sport things, um, but never, never that good about, never that good at them. Okay. I suppose from like what you're asking is, did I pick up loads of stuff? And I, and I did, but I didn't yeah. know I was. Yeah, that, that's uh, the beauty in it. Yeah, that's yeah. the beauty. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And do you reckon, because off your own saying, you say your ability wasn't great, wasn't wasn't you're not saying you were crap, but you weren't you weren't amazing. So yeah. are you looking at Sports and sports people that are involved in a different manner, if that makes sense. Are you seeing the other side of sport, how you can get the best out of somebody, again, without probably knowing it, really? Yeah, and I think that was yeah. a little bit of a driver in me getting involved in, in coaching and and and, um, and performance analysis and, and what have you, was that I had the, I had this, this, uh, this thought that, you know what, I can I can actually help people to get better because I know that I wasn't that good at the stuff that I did, the sports that I played, but I knew I, I knew how to play. I, I, I you know my head would tell me to do one thing, but my legs would tell me something completely different to, yeah. to what I mean. And and um, I think from that I, I got this understanding of well, actually, if I can help somebody to understand how to play a game, how to play a sport. Then it might help them. Um, might, might help them further the career a little bit. Yeah. So let's touch base on it. What you started taking rugby league series at sixteen there. So that's the back end of high school, and it mate. So what were your options with rugby, and what were your options leaving school, mate? Um. So with, with rugby, I thought that I was going to be, I was going to get signed up for an academy, and I was going to be a pro player, and I was going to uh, be, I was going to be, um. I don't know, the next Sean Edwards or whatever, um, and just be a brilliant rugby player. But I realised that I wasn't going to be that. Yeah. Um, so after, after leaving school, school was like the Wild West when I went to school. So it was like sort of uh, mid-80s um, when, when I went to high school, and it was like the Wild West. Teachers yeah. were on strike all the time. Kids got away with everything. Um Things that you saw um, made you think: Is that is that looking back now? Is thinking is that normal? And it's yeah. definitely not. So it was a bit like the Wild West. So we got away with whatever we wanted, and I unfortunately just took it pretty much literally from, from in school and, and didn't do a lot. So okay. I then went to college. And thought, you know what, I'll I'll uh, I'll, I'll sail through college because it's dead easy. But I was bored out of my mind at college, so I just ended up I ended up jacking it all in and getting a job. Right. Um, I went well, I went working for for Wing Council for a, for a few months, uh, and then got a job with the tax office right. um, when I was seventeen, um, and that was um, something that meant that I had a little bit of cash in my pocket. I could go out with my mates and I can go out with my girlfriend at, at, at the weekend. I could buy a car. I could do all those things that I thought were brilliant and made me feel yeah. grown up. So I, I, I sort of concentrated on that as well as playing, still playing a little bit of rugby. I played, I played yeah. at Jude's for a couple of years. Right. And still playing a little bit of rugby. So 
um, that that was that was it really after school, and that's what that's what I focused on a bit. Yeah. So when you were playing rugby, mate, what was what was the standard like before you left school? Out. So you, with you, probably half uh, knowing you're not you're not the best player. How did you? Because St Jude's play a good standard, don't they? And or did they then as well? Yeah. 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 So, so how was that? That that was it. That was really eye opening for me because what what happened was I I went into a team of same age groups sort of under sixteens and I'm looking yeah. around at everybody else and they're all a bit bigger than them and they've been playing a few years and what have you and there's some decent players in there there were a couple of lads that turned pro uh, Craig Macon who played who played at Witness for a, yeah. for a few years he was he was sort of the probably the best player. And then the following year, we went into under 18s, and there were some lads in there that were a bit older again, who had sort of played a bit of academy rugby, but then came back and played a little bit of um, rugby for St Jude's, who were ended up being some of the best amateur rugby players in the in the country because uh, they yeah. went on and played for Great Britain for right. for uh, I don't know how many times they went on tour to Australia and New Zealand as, a, as an amateur and things like that. So. Do you reckon um, that's because of the pathway, Dave, or do you think they just had that anyway? I think they just had that anyway, because at the yeah. time, the, the, there wasn't necessarily a pathway. Okay. What, what it was at the time was um, what we call the District Development Association. And it was, you can go and play for the DDA if you're yeah. good enough, but you go and play, you go back and play for your, for your club. But then if you're better than anybody else in that district development association, which is basically town team for yeah. 16 under 18s at the time, is that you then get signed up into Wigan's reserves, Wigan's A team. So yeah, the A team, yeah. Yeah, the old A team sort of structure. And that's how it that's how it was. Uh, and then they sent you back to your amateur club if you didn't get a game with the A team. Yeah. So it was a bit like that, to to be fair. Um so there, there wasn't really a pathway like there is now for for young players. Um, but there's, it was just, they were tough. These lads were tough. They were quick and they were skillful. So they got a go, but there's, yeah. there's you know, there's, you can count, you can count hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of, uh, young, uh, young people that have been like that around the Northwest have been quick, skillful and, 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 and tough who yeah. ended up playing rugby league for a bit. Um, and then buggered off and went, uh, because it was, um, they weren't getting paid that much or whatever, yeah. and the job too over. So it was a little bit like that. Yeah. So it's bit obviously it's it's pre-professionalism, but it's yeah. they've gone from as professional as they can be to potentially social rugby pretty yeah. quickly. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. So when did you become interested in that side of not only sport but mentally? Because because that's your job now. You're like a special mental coach, aren't you? So when did that? begin to creep into your life on a more serious matter? So um, I sort of, um, so me, me, me and my, my wife now, um, yeah. my girlfriend at the time, we bought our first house, we were like in our early 20s, um, got married, had our, first, uh, had our first daughter, and then it was then that I started to think about, well, I want to get involved in coaching. Yeah. Um, and coaching for me was a, a little bit more than just showing people how to catch a ball and, and run with it. Um, it was uh, trying to sort of tap into the the um, the knowledge and their understanding uh, and try and figure out them as human beings, as people. Because um, the, the job that I did, I worked at the tax office. I worked with an array of different with different people from lots of different backgrounds because I worked in in, uh, in Manchester in the city, yeah. so we we got lots of different people from lots of different backgrounds, lots of different ages, and I saw loads of um, loads of examples of people living the life in different ways. So it made me think about well, how can I then use that how people behave and how people think to then aid my coaching, and then I can I can see if I can get the best out of people. So that that's where it started really. It's mad, isn't it, to think you were breaking, not in a bad way, you're breaking a character down in your early 20s in, without being really just an everyday nine-to-five job, wasn't you? And yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Virtually psychoanalyzing people, because like you say to yourself, some people cook and call through life, some people struggle, some people thrive, 
it's yeah. just environment and attitude to suppose, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I, we, so you know, I, I used to have um I used to have a a, a, a a colleague that I worked with. She she was about 20, 20 25 years old or something like that. And she'd tell me about what her Sunday nights were like at home because she hated Monday morning. And Sunday night for her was she was in the worst place possible in her yeah, life. Yeah, pure anxiety and stuff. A- absolutely, yeah. yeah. So she didn't, she, she absolutely detested work on a Monday mm. morning. But she was there, she was fine. Yeah. But Sunday nights were an absolute nightmare for her. And that's always stuck with me, that. So yeah. why why do people, why are people like that? So I, I, I'll sort of try and uh, take little bits of that from, um, from those experiences into... And what I can do now, I suppose. Yeah. And what environment was next burning in mind? That's what you wanted to do. Well, I was uh, so started doing a little bit of coaching yeah. um, at uh, Shevington Sharks right. with the uh, sort of the, the under 12s team. And then I got an opportunity to go and do some representative coaching for Northwest Counties. Um, and Northwest Counties was playing uh, a, a New South Wales touring team, uh, and, and at the time, this the, it was sort of an under seventeens. I hadn't done a lot of stuff with under seventeens players. I'd done it was about under twelves, yeah. and these lads were just on the cusp of of maybe going into an academy environment because it was a, a academy that it, academy had started then. Yeah, um, and. I was basically I applied for it, got got the position, and then first day there, the, the the head coach said to me, "I didn't want you. You were the you weren't the first choice." Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Nick. I don't think really appreciate that, but I'm there for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks, Nick. But but then I think what that meant meant me, meant me doing is that I tried a lot harder than yeah. he did. So that I could influence the players and I could Im- impress people and what have you. Um, and then on the back of that, the guy that did all the admin stuff also did the admin for Lancashire under 16s. So he, he asked me to go and coach the, the Lancashire under 16s um, yeah. at, at the time. And, and that they were, they none of those lads have been signed professionally, but. Um, Looking back now, it was um, some of those some of those lads then went on and played professionally and had good careers and long careers. Particularly some of the Yorkshire lads that we played against, we played Yorkshire and Ryan Bailey. If you remember Ryan Bailey, yeah, yeah. Leeds um, and uh, Chev Walker in particular, those two ripped us apart, ripped us to pieces. Um, and they, they were the two that I remembered from that. Um, from that game that we played against them at Yorkshire and, uh, at, uh, at Featherstone. Yeah. Um, so that that's that's how it's starting to develop then. Um, and me thinking I've got to try harder than, than the other coaches, I go watching the lads all over the place and I ended up going watching uh, a trial match, a school's trial match, um, and bumped into uh, a gentleman called Brian Foley Brian at the time was the uh, head of um, youth development at Wigan, and we got chatting. and He said, "Dave, why don't you come to? Uh, why don't you come and have a look at what we do in our scholarship? Said, you might not, you might not like it, but why don't you come down and, and and see what's what?" And and that was the start of me getting involved at Wigan. It's mad, so really, mate. Not that you you didn't have the work ethic anywhere, but that one guy. Not, not maybe not belittling you, but trying to put his little stamp on you, maybe. Yeah, that's just lit something in you. Yeah, that's took yeah. off, isn't it? Oh yeah, definitely. And it, yeah. and it's, it, 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 you know, it, it happened a few times in my career as well. Um, right. Uh, I, 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 I don't know whether I should name names, but you know, there no. were a couple of high-profile coaches that said the same thing to me, and, and that sort of. You know, spurred me on a little bit more to sort of prove them wrong. Yeah, um, and yourself right as well, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, just yeah. To say, you know, I can actually do this. I, I can, I, I can do this yeah. thing that, um, that I'm that I, I love. Uh, I really enjoy. So yeah. yeah. So do you know between that 16s and 17s teams you done? 
So 16 is not quite being signed. So probably with a little bit raw. Yeah. And maybe to a degree, mate, a little bit more keen. Like, like I thought a little bit like, yeah, I could just play rugby all my life and I'll find a job that'll just subsidise yeah. me rugby. Yeah. But some of the, some of them at 17 might have already thought they'd made it. What yeah. was the what was the big difference do you remember from them two age groups? I think the big difference from the two age groups um was the the, the sixteens players because of the, the they played at such um they were all trying to get signed if that yeah. made sense. But the 17s lot, some of them had and some of them hadn't. So some of them had sort of gone, well, it's not for me this. I'm not yeah. going to be a pro, so I'm going to stick with playing amateur rugby. But the 16s lads were still desperately trying to prove to everybody that they were good enough to get a pro contract. And I think out the the 22-man squad that that um, that we had, um, I think probably half of them ended up being professional players. Yeah, good numbers. That, that, amazing, isn't it? That, yeah. Um, and had decent careers as well, so, you know, earned good money from it. Yeah. You know what I mean? so, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was good stuff. And what, what are you looking for? Not only in a player, but in a person at that age, which I'll ask you again later on as we go through. But yeah. what, what attributes stand out on and off the pitch for you as a kid that, well, a, a late team that you'd really want to buy into? Yeah. It's, I think... I think being honest um, and not trying to uh, blag your way through um, the the guys that the guys that I've worked with who have been successful and good long successful careers have all been honest because they've all all been that be, being that have been able to look themselves in the mirror and say that wasn't good enough today. Or that they've been able to say, yeah, I had a good game today. I, I know I did everything that I could do. Um, and being honest with with other people around them, but also being honest with with uh, coaches as well. Um, that that was the value that I saw um, was the the the, the, uh, the biggest one from a character perspective um, as being the one that I thought would be would enable them or determine that they would become good rugby players. Yeah, it's a, a little bit different. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a life skill, isn't it? It's a life yeah. quality, isn't it? Uh, being honest um, and sort of owning up to stuff and 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 uh, telling people what they think um, and not sugarcoating stuff and what have you. Yeah. It, it helps you all the way through your life. And, that, you know, I can I can think of one, per, one player now who... who um, wasn't like that, but played at a decent standard, played some good um, academy rugby, um, but then went off the rails a little bit. And it yeah. was only after he went off the rails a little bit that he got his life back together again and went, actually, I can look, I can look myself in the mirror now. And now he's got a, a, a successful, um, well, he, his career goes from strength to strength every time that I bump into him or, or you know, yeah. You see on, on social media, he's got another promotion at work and things like that. And that's brilliant. Yeah. Didn't, didn't play a lot of rugby after after that, but he, it's brilliant that he's uh, yeah. he's made a success of his life because he's, be, he's become, um, he's realised being honest was, was probably the best trait that he could uh, could learn. I was going to say, that is like, as much as people say it's a cliche, it's an ample. Not only are you trying to build a better player, but more importantly, the game and a forever game for people. Yeah, like life's forever, isn't it? How absolutely. you get treated and treat people forever, right? Yeah, and that's absolutely. what you're looking at doing, isn't it, mate? Improving the person as well as the player. Yeah, yeah. and that you know, there's lot, there's there's lots of different factors in, involved in that. Um, but what we're trying to do, or what I always think about when I'm coaching, um, or when I'm working with a group of players, is that I'm there to help the help them to become better. I'm not going to make them better. They're going to make themselves better. I'm I'm going to be there to help them. So that's always been that's always been my, my thought process. But I think yeah. and I think particularly because I, I had that that guy saying to me, "Didn't want you here. I wanted someone else." Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So that, yeah. that, that, and that's how they respond to you as well, isn't it? Because you can already tell the way you put things across. You're very articulate. You're clear. Yeah. That's all a player wants. If you're going to be direct, articulate, clear. 
yeah. to them, they'll be that right back at you, whether it's verbally or in actions, isn't it? It's all that he's yeah. wants, yeah? yeah? Yeah, exactly, yeah. So when when does a healthy challenge from a player appeal to you? So what, first of all, what would you determine a healthy challenge to be? Because there's one thing, saying, well, actually, I don't quite agree with that, Dave, but yeah. there's a way of saying it, isn't there, if that makes yeah. sense? Yeah, of course there is. Of course there is. I've had a player say to me, you're a cheat. Okay. We, we didn't um, we didn't see eye to eye for, for a couple of days after that, let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, but then I've had players come to me and say, I'm not sure about this. What This is what I think, and this is why I think it. As long as they've got a reason and they can articulate it, I listen. And if I don't agree, then I'll always go back to them and say, well, I don't agree, and here's my reason why I don't agree. Yeah. And probably four out of every five players that I've had conversations like that with, they've accepted it. Yeah, it's just the odd one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's just the odd one that just says, you know what, I'm right, you're wrong, that's it. It doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what you do. I'm right, you're wrong. And that's fine. Yeah. But as long as it doesn't affect the other players, the collective, the yeah. group, because then if it does, then we know that what starts to happen is that the cohesion in the team starts to break down a little bit and it, it gets a bit messy then. Yeah. And would would you rather that in like a little, you get the laptop out and it's a one-to-one with so many little clips and then you can have that sort of chat then, can't you? Then? Yeah. Yeah, but, but I like it as well. I, I used to like it as well with um, with players when I ask them questions about about stuff. I, I might be showing them some video. It might be a group of players I'm showing some video to, for example, and I'm asking them questions because they've got the answers. They go out and they go and play. They do it on the field, not the coaches or the analyst. Yeah. So. I like them, uh, and particularly the one, one, one player in particular would always come back and say, so what do you think? What do you think we should do? And, and I always have that in my back pocket to, to sort of come to him and say, come to any player and say, this is what I think you should do. Yeah. This is why I think you should do it. And this is how I think, how you should, I think you should do it. When the player then comes back and says, well, I don't see that. Or I don't feel it, or I'm not sure. That's when we can have that 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 sort of yeah. discussion. But I always have that in my back pocket when I'm asking that question about yeah. what what do you reckon here? Where do you think you should go? How do you think you should pass? Should you kick here? What about your tackling? What about your defending? All that sort of stuff. Yeah. So that's that's the idea behind the way that I approach um, that that healthy engagement with players. Yeah, because that's a meaningful question if you've got an answer, mate. It's not just something you've just rigged up off watching a little clip there. Yeah. And, and most of the time, the players play what they've seen, haven't they? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. if you can bring something out to that scenario, yeah, I'd say seven out of ten scenarios, they're going to be in again. Yeah. Yeah. And it's about it's about being clinical then, isn't it? And 100%. Yeah. So you you walk through the doors at Wigan, mate, and what it what it's you there straight away at scholarship level is it, is it something where you instantly feel I can I can make a difference here? At first, yeah. at first, no. At right. first, I walk in and go, "Oh my god, these guys, imagine. these kids are amazing." Yeah. Um, they are they're doing everything so quick, so clean, so clinical. They know what they're doing. At thirteen and fourteen and fifteen, and I'm and I'm looking at this and thinking, how am I going to get the best out of these kids? But then after a, after a little bit, I'm I'm sort of looking around at, at the other coaches and thinking, well, I've got a different approach to you, and maybe that's my 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 unique selling point, I suppose, if you want to call it, yeah. is that I've got a different approach to them. I've all, I've always thought that I could break down a game reasonably well and break down a practice and break down a skill so that I can then say, let's concentrate on one thing rather than concentrate on seven or eight different things. Yeah. And that's where the clarity comes when, when you're talking to those players. And that's what I sort of got over to them. 
and I don't mind them having a laugh and a joke and a, and having the crack as well, and and which which they've you know at my expense sometimes. <laughs> but as long as it's you know there's no malice involved in it. Yeah. As long as it's just um, as it's intended, and yeah. just have a bit of fun and, and 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 have some enjoyment, and and that's where I sort of connected. I, that's where I thought I connected with the players was having that technical understanding and 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 then the ability to to get it over to them and build some sort of rapport and relationship with them. Yeah, so a bit of be jovial when it's the right time to be jovial, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. do you think you may be not just early part of your career when the guys said that to you or later on in your career when the big characters have said it. Do you think because you've not not necessarily born and bred, but you've not been involved in rugby since you come out the womb. Yeah. And you you didn't rock up to school with a ball under your arm just because you're a wigginer. Do you think that went against you a few times or yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um I didn't play town team, you know. So um It's so incredible how much those bonds and those relationships are formed when when kids go and represent the the town. Uh, you know, it's a little bit different now, but you know, back then, late eighties, early nineties, when you represent Widnes or Wigan or St Helens or whatever, you stuck together all the way through, and that's and you and you realised how good other players were from other teams. Yeah, you got some friendships. You know, one lad goes to one school, somebody goes to a different school, play at different teams, never see each other, come together for town team. It's like, wow, how good are you? How good are you? You're my mate now. And that they they sort of those things stick together. Yeah. Um, and I didn't have that. So maybe it was, there was a little bit of that. Um, because certainly there's certainly something to be ha- something to be said about. Um, forming bonds and relationships that help create um, uh, long-lasting friendships but long-lasting um, working relationships as well. Yeah, because you'll remember Fred as well, you, Dave. Uh, yeah, so so to- I think Tony worked at Witness just before I did. Yeah. Uh, so Fred has brought a good point up about you think it's hard to get into that environment, but actually as you're growing up as a kid, it's even harder to not get in the environment to get out. Yeah. And I think maybe that's a little bit of what you're getting at as well. It's like, what, yeah, it seems to be a culture once you're in, you're in. Yeah. And you'd have to be extraordinary to break that bubble, wouldn't you? Even at a young age. Yeah, very true. Very true that. But yeah, it just, because I was probably, to be honest, especially later on, I was probably one of them kids that I shouldn't have been there. I'd yeah. lost a little bit of, like, of love for the game. I'd, I'd stagnated yeah. in development. Lads were well to the pass me. I'd put a yeah. bit of weight on. I was probably just, I weren't even a squad filler. I was just there because I'd been there since town team. When yeah. there was probably lads just as good, if not better. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. must have been looking, thinking, how's he got in here? Yeah. And it did. It's when he said it, I thought he's right, really. Yeah. And it's a shame yeah. that, in it? It's, it shouldn't. Yeah, it shouldn't be that way, but yeah, I suppose is. that's yeah. life and sport can be cruel, which I've no doubt you're learning a bit and we'll talk about. So when you start at scholarship level, mate, what what tempts you to progress? Did you want to progress? Did you was you happy at that core group? And I, I as as soon as I as soon as I got myself used to being there every every week, seeing the lads, um coaching. Chevy Sharks at, at the weekend, um, and and getting into um, getting into that week in week out, and then seeing what other people did, seeing what the academy coaches did, and seeing what what first team coaches did, that was it. I, that was I, I, that's I was I mithered the living daylights out of Dean Bell, who was the um, he was the the um, football manager, I suppose. Um, his title was at the time and neither the living daylights out of him to actually go and do something with the academy even if it was just going picking cones up for the coach so I could learn from them and learn from the players 
and and um, eventually he said, "Yeah, go on, go on, go on, go and help Jeb burn out with the under 18s and 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 what have you." At the back end of the the year, so I I couldn't interfere with anything, I couldn't spoil anything, whatever. It was just yeah. a case of me being the observing, um, helping Jed out, bring you know, pump the balls up, bring the equipment out, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and that was sort of the end then. As soon as I had a taste, I wanted more. Yeah. And do you think being in that environment and then going back to Chevy, do you reckon that for one might have attracted a few players to Chev that might not have went? And two, putting a putting a marker on Chev from opposition saying, listen, Dave's involved with we're going to go and set a marker out. A little bit. Um, she- Chevy at the time was a group of a group of uh, lads that had been together for a long time. They'd been sort of the same team since they were sort of under nines, under tens, or whatever. Um, and yeah, they sort of, I think they came together. So they were two separate groups, two separate teams, and came together at, at under tens, I think. And I, I sort of grabbed all of them under sixteens, and um, so. They didn't really have a big reputation, but what I did find was when when we went into under eighteens that I was able to to attract other players from other from other teams because they I don't I don't know whether it was my reputation or it wasn't my reputation I yeah. I, I don't want to sort of be, you know, say say that I, I, it was my it was my because of me um, but, but it may have been. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, 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 you know, it might have been, but there were a couple yeah. of lads that sort of attracted, uh, attracted from from other clubs who came came to play and and did a great, were, were brilliant for us because they're a bit older, a little bit bigger. Um, they were leaders that and everybody looked up to them, and, and well, the mates now. Yeah, yeah, a long time. You know, they've been mates for a long time now. So, which is which yeah. is brilliant, isn't it? Yeah. So when did Climbing the ladder become an option for you, because like you said, you, you're just uh, being a sponge for the yeah. time being, aren't you? Yeah, like yeah. above above the early scholarship level. Yeah, it happened when one year. So Mike Gregory came to the to, to Wigan. Mike was the under 19s coach. He'd, he'd done some um, representative rugby. Um, and he'd worked at Saints and he'd, work, he'd worked at Swinton and what have you. And he came to Wigan as under 19s coach. And same thing happened again. Am I the Dean, the living day like of Dean Bell and said, Can I just can I can I go and assist him? Can I be his assistant? And he yeah, yeah, all right, okay. We, we, we'll 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 do it. So I, my first meeting with, with Greg. He said exactly the same thing to me as the as the other guy did okay. with um, the Northwest Counties. I didn't want you. I wanted somebody that had a, a profession uh, who had had some experience in professional rugby. Um, and straight away, I'm thinking, well, I'm going to prove you. I'm going to prove to you that I deserve to be here, um, which I did. And, to, probably to the detriment of of having a, a detriment of the, the relationship with my wife at the time because I was out out for six out of seven nights a week. Yeah, um, which she you know quite rightly gave me stick about. I I thought it was all right at the time, but you know, eventually realised that it wasn't. But yeah. Greg was pretty good in that he sort of said a few months down the line he went, Dave, you've proved yourself pretty much. Uh, I can see you're an honest bloke. You're decent. You're good with the lads. You know what you're talking about. Um, so you have sort of proved me wrong, sort of thing. And and that meant meant a lot. It really did meant a lot coming from Mike Gregory, former Great Britain captain. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. Um, but that that was where it sort of sort of took hold a little bit, and then. Uh, Dean Bell rang me up one one um, um, one night and said, "Dave, can you get um, can you get a day off work?" I'm thinking, "Yeah, I can just have a day off next week and come in and what, what do you want?" He said, "No, I mean every week." So because I've got an, I've got an option for you. Um, I think because I'd sort of proved myself a little bit with scholarship and and, and doing some coaching with with Mike Gregory. 
they offer me a position work with first team uh, as uh, as a performance analyst. I think it was, and I, I, I don't know, you have to ask Dean this, but I think it was because I knew how to work on computer and I knew something about rugby. <laughs> I, think, I think that was what it was. Yeah. But, but Dean offered me that. Um, I had some really difficult conversations with my boss at work, um, which went on for a couple of weeks. And then eventually they sort of gave me that, that um, I went part-time the four days a week rather than five days a week. And then yeah. worked at Wigan for a day. And that was my, that was my in started working with, started working with the first team then. So, yeah. Yeah. And what, because you, you're in of like a performance analyst and stuff and you just think it's a name, for example, for all one out, it's Liam Farrell, tackle, carry, tackle bus. You know the typical stats on Sky and yeah. playing sports? Yeah, So yeah. explain to us that it, I know it's much more, listeners and viewers will know it's much more, Yeah. but not to an extent that obviously you understand it. So put it across a little bit, what you covered, mate, please. So right at the right at the very start, because it was it was new. Yeah. No, nobody else did it in rugby league. They did did it in football. Um, there were some examples of it in rugby union, but nobody did it in rugby league. Um so it, it was a lot of trial and error for a for a couple of years. And it was literally just that, you know, yeah. player, carry, win, player, tackle, miss, player, tackle. It was literally just that right. for um, for a couple of years until I sort of got my head around. Well, actually, I can I can do something with all this stuff. And then started when then we started really digging deep into the opposition. Um, spent a little bit more so spent a bit more time with with first teams. It was around one day a week. It was two days a week. It was match days. It was what have you. Um, then I started to understand this is how I think we can beat this team that we're going to play against this weekend. And maybe putting something together where I would approach the coach and say, this is what I've found about the opposition. This is how I think that we can win. And then when it worked, the coach started to get a little bit more trust in me. And the coach would then come to me and say, can you have a look at whoever, whoever we yeah. play? You know, we, what go and watch Saints for a couple of weeks and then tell me how we're going to beat Saints. And then that happened and we and we did. So that was part of it. But what would effectively, I mean, that was 20, 20 odd years ago now. Yeah. Effectively, what, what being an analyst is today is understanding, understanding the game, creating data from everything that happens in the game, everything. Yeah. And then putting some meaning to those things that actually happen in a game. So whenever you carry the ball, you might carry the ball 15 times, but are there 15 good ones or 15 bad ones? Yeah. Um, which, which of them create something for somebody else? There's, so there's so we we sort of go into a lot of detail. Or we did we, we did start to go into a lot of detail that we thought that the players should see. Yeah, it, it just blew the players' minds. They, they weren't interested in that stuff. They just wanted to. Okay. Talk. What one of who were playing? Who were playing against them? Tell me how we could beat them, and I'll go. I'll go and do it. So we, so I sort of backed off a little bit from doing throwing loads of information at them. Yeah. Um. And just kept it for myself. But what I did was because it was something that we did year, week on week, month on month, year on year, it became systematic. And I understood then that when a certain thing was happening in a game, for example, yeah. um, I, I have a, a, a what, what I call a seven set principle because the game never or very, very rarely goes beyond seven sets without a break. Yeah. So for that is, we're going to have it, Saints have it, we're going to have it, Saints have it, that, that sort of yeah, idea. Yeah, set for set, yeah. Yeah. It very rarely goes beyond seven sets. So what that does is when I'm saying that to the coach and to the fitness and to the fitness coach is 
they can then design a practice based on what I what I've learned from me analyzing the game. So it means that they can be more intense with their practice so that when they actually go out and play, they can raise a level of intensity. So there, there are little things like that. My my understanding eventually was my job is to influence practice. Yeah. Because if I influence practice, then that's going to influence the way that the game's played. Performance, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And when you say your you seven set thing for, for listeners and viewers, it'll be consecutive sets without an error, without yeah. ball out of field. Yeah. So seven solid yeah. sets. And if you think a minute and a half, a set of six, isn't it? Give it to um, me. It might have been a bit longer then, but not much. Well, the, the it again, the, there's um, it, it depends on your tactics really and where about you're in the field. But witness one year we we um we we went really really simple and really really basic when I first started working at witness. So the first first team was literally um. Mark Smith carried from dummy half, then Damien Blanche carried from dummy half, then um, Gavin Dodd carried from dummy half, then uh, I don't know, Matt, then Bob Bezic carried from dummy half, and and we got through a set of six in forty seconds. Yeah. Then what we realised was when we got through a set of six, you can't keep seconds, doing that. we were yeah. gassed and we we couldn't defend because we hadn't. Yeah. We had, do you know what I mean? So yeah, but that that. It, it, it's about a minute a set, so it, it, it tended to be about that seven minute mark. Yeah, and it, it's like you said, you're as you're governing the intelligence. It's early as a field. It's yeah. pressure you've already had on them. Yeah. It, what I know, a lot of people viewers is like, why aren't they trying to score every play? Because it's not about scoring every play. It's about no, building it's the pressure and yeah. earning the right to score, isn't it? And Un- yeah, hundred yeah, percent. Yeah. Look a little, little bit. I went to the um, Wales Cook Island games last that game last night, yeah. and Cook Islands basically did that. They were twelve six down. Wales were playing pretty well. Yeah. And Cook Island just went. You know what? We're just going to roll our sleeves up and earn the right to play here, and just grind Wales down. And they did, yeah. and, and ended up scoring a, a couple of tries in the second half and, and winning the game. So um, that was the they were earning the right to build pressure, they were earning the right to get a, a repeat set, they were earning the right to get field position, all yeah. those different things. And that's what the, that's effectively what um you what know, happened, wasn't it? What happened. Yeah. yeah. And the best teams don't get bored of that day, do they? No. Yeah. <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. And the simple things are you kick chase. Yeah. Like some to be fair to Matty last night, some of his kicks to the corner were good. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. then all of a sudden, uh, the young guy who was like a bit of footwork and he made 20 yards. Yeah. And does the kick, on it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So how long at Wigan was you before? Did you seek an opportunity to challenge yourself or was it an offer you couldn't turn down or was it mutual? Was it Wigan's way? Was it your way? Well, I worked... So I was really fortunate that I worked with some really, really good, intelligent people at Wigan. Um, so I, I worked with Mike Gregory before he got ill. Yeah. Um, Dennis Betts took over, who um, is one of the most intelligent, uh, uh, deep thinking coaches that I've worked with. Um, I worked with Stuart Rape for a bit um, and, and Stuart just he knew the game inside out, um, but he put too much pressure on himself. Uh, and then Ian Millwall came in um, and totally and utterly ripped the heart out of the club or, or out of the team. Um, and I then started to think, my time's up here. It's time for me to go. Um, so I, uh, one of the guys that, that, that I worked with, that, that uh, I'd worked with the year before, I'd left and he'd gone to witness. And I just mentioned something to him in passing and just saying, look, mate, if there's anything crops up at witness, let me know. Um, I I want to coach, but, you know, I'll I'll do this and what have you. And at the time, Steve McCormack was head coach. Yeah. And funnily funnily enough, I'd played for St. Jude's with Steve McCormack. Um, 
small and world, mate. Very small yeah. world. Um, and then I got a phone call from him um, to say, I believe you, you're looking to move. Um, do you want to have a do you want to have a chat? And we we had a chat, and um, I, I couldn't turn down what he was what he was suggesting. He wanted me to lead the academy and to to do some performance analysis with the first team. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a wrench leaving Wigan because I'm a Wiganer and yeah. Wigan's my team. That's the team, yeah. in it, hometown oh, team. Abs- yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, but I'd been in, I'd been involved in two or three or two particular games that people might remember when Saints put 70 points on us yeah. and then the week after Leeds put 70 points on us because the, the heart had been ripped out of the team and I just thought you know when that happened um, it was time for me to go and challenge myself somewhere else Fair enough and before we go on to the witness spell mate is, is that summer all coaches do or did he stick a bit of faith in who's there and maybe compliment it more than rip it apart sort of thing? Um, I think that's personality driven yeah. with some coaches. I think some coaches um, want to put a stamp on things because they've got their way of doing things and they've got their way of playing and some players may not be capable of doing that. Yeah. Um, and I think that's that was the idea um, at the time. And um, it, it sort of completely it deconstructed the whole thing. Um, we're gonna have a obviously had a production line of talent coming through, some really really strong young players. But then they weren't given an opportunity; they were moved on okay. um, because wanted to One bring in play, other yeah. people in who could who could play who could play a different way and what have you. So that was the idea, I think. And is that a big buzz when you've? You've been involved, say, at that under 13, 14 level, and then you come across them again at 16 to 18, and then the next minute, the 18th man on on the bench for the first team. Is that like, bet you that's a bit of a job done, a real pride moment, isn't it? 100%. 100%. So, pe- so people at the time, so people like um, James Coyle, you know, has played yeah. at Witness for, yeah. for a bit, um, Sean Gleason, um, who, who played in that. Saints loss. They both played in that Saints loss, I think. We're, we're, we're Wigan lost by 70 points. Um, Sean Gleason, you know, doing stuff with him in the academy, uh, sorry, in the in the scholarship, sort of 15. And then a couple of years later, he's, in, he's making his debut for first team. Yeah. And it's brilliant. Think just things like that just make um, and give you a buzz. So that, that was more exciting sometimes. Than, um, than seeing a, a, a big Aussie signing. But it was, yeah, yeah. And just played for the, you know, just played State of Origin the year before and, and what yeah. uh, the, the buzz was the, the, the 17 year old or 18 year old getting his uh, getting his, his debut. debut. So, yeah. Yeah. And on the other flip of the coin, mate, he was involved in them big drubbings. How do you let him know that's not the norm and let him just shrug it off and keep plugging in it? How, how do you do that? Yeah, it was hard. It really was hard because obviously, you know, people are, people have pride, don't they? Um, and don't want to be necessarily challenged by a bloke that don't that don't know out, never done anything in the game. Um, so you you don't want to be challenged by a nobody, do you? You don't want to be, you know, not somebody who has been told more than once that yeah. you're not enough. You're not coming here. I don't want. I don't want you to work with me. Um, why should he listen to? Why should he listen to me? Um, and and that was a really difficult, um, difficult scenario, different, difficult situation. Going into the coach and explain to the coach what I'd found because that was my job as an analyst. Yeah. Time, and then the coach saying no, I disagree with you. No, no, no. It was really difficult. So you come over to. To God's country, mate, a witness. And <laughs> what's the feeling like compared to the early Wigan days when you walk through at witness and you hit with what you hit with at witness? How was it? When I first when I first came to witness, they were so so accommodating. They were so they, they just seemed like every single person in the club was a nice person. 
which g- genuinely they, they were. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the board of directors, um, like Tom Fleet, for example, Tom Tom had been a director for, for a number of years, and, um, and Peter uh, and Pete Pete Barrow, who's one of the, the, the directors, were just lovely people, really nice people that would uh, help you out if you needed, you know, what, whatever help that you needed. And then the yeah. people who were in the office, or so Janet Fazy, for example, um, and if Janet watches this and uh, or listens to this and um, becomes embarrassed by me mentioning her, then good because she w- she was sort of the, the heart and soul of of um, the, the backroom staff because she sort of she was the glue that kept everything together and such a such a wonderful person and so That's what clubs are built on, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And such such a warm um, such a warm individual. So so that was really easy. To walking in and, and feeling uh, and feeling accepted, that was great. Steve Mack um, was, you know, I said before that one of the traits that I like in a player is is honesty. That's yeah. what Steve. That's what Steve has. Um, but he understands how to how, how to work with people. Um, he, right. he does a great job of what he does now. He works with yeah. um, works with rugby league curs and, and and does a fantastic job with them because. Yeah. He, because he's he's got a high level of emotional intelligence, um, and he and me coming to the club, he was there to help and guide and support me, uh, because he you know he he'd been and he'd done stuff, um, at Salford and at Whitehaven and what have you, but he was there to to help and support and guide, which was great. And um, and there's you know there are a couple of people that that helped me out with the academy. So Steve Hunt, I don't know whether you know Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a what a fantastic fella, uh, Roger Harrison. Yeah. Um, wonderful people um, who were witness. Obviously, they were witness through and through. Proper rugby people, weren't they? Absolutely, yeah. proper rugby league people um, who were there and, and, and helped me to sort of settle in, help me to understand the 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 lay of the land, sort of thing. Help me to understand all the people that were that were there and help me to understand other all, all the players as well. So it. Um, it was just great. It really was. Yeah. And when when you go in and are you given like a, a bit of a blank canvas, mate? Is it analyse what you've got, tell us what you might need, tell us what you don't need? Is that how it is, or is it this is what you've got caught yet? Yeah? yeah, to a to an extent. Um, so I had a, so I I walked in with a and there was a squad of maybe thirty six players, and sort of straight away I thought. There's too many players here. I can't. Yeah, I can't give. I can't give everybody a go every week, and it's it's going to be a bit unfair on people to get them to to turn up to training week in week out, and then knowing that uh, they're only going to play every every month, once a month or, or whatever. So um, we we sort. I sort of went about trying to change things a little bit in that. I would sort of reduce that that squad down a little bit. I was fortunate enough, very fortunate that I was given, um, I was basically given carte blanche. I could do what I wanted. The only, the only thing that I was told was if I need a, so Steve Mack, if I need a player for first team, that's it. Yeah. But he's not playing reserves. He's playing academy because we want to keep them all in the academy because we want them to develop. And he, he had, he understood the, 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 the 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 benefit of keeping a group of players together so that they can benefit so that when they got a bit older they could then go into the first team and go on challenging first team and things like that so yeah we're fortunate enough to be able to put together a, a, a really good group of uh, uh, of players John Foran had, had, a, had, a, had a big say in that because he, he was the guy that was signing all the players at under 16s and what have you yeah um but then I you know we had um, we had a good balance in the squad eventually. So from having 36 players, we I think we got down to about 28, I think it was. And out of those 28, there's probably 14, 15 of them that were the top age, and about six or seven that they were sort of middle age, and then the, there was three, three that they were the youngest, youngest age, uh, yeah. but they were outstanding players at that age. So 
uh, Tom Wood Hume. I don't know whether you know. Yeah, Tom. Wood too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Shane Grady and Richie Myler. So they, yeah. they were the three that uh, that sort of signed um, as the youngest age group players. They've done all right, haven't they? I know Woodsy. Um, he was drastically unlucky, Woodsy, with his knee on it. He had oh, like yeah. chronic knee yeah. injuries, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, he he's gone on and he he, he um, worked out uh, a, a decent business for himself, and I know that he's, he's got himself a good job. I spoke I was yeah. speaking to him last year, and obviously Shane's still um, plugging still away, playing. isn't he? Yeah. yeah. No way did I think that that tall, skinny, ginger kid who was a winger would end up uh, as a front, a, a ball headed front rower. That's it, yeah. Oh, like a goal kicking fullback when I was playing with him, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and obviously Rick, Rick, you know, Richie's on everything, hasn't he? Yeah. So um super proud. I'm super proud of him. So yeah. yeah. And we've touched we've touched on honesty, mate, both on and off the field. And yeah. even at that young age when you're having to have them difficult chats with with lads, i.e. the six or eight that went. Yeah. How are they and how do you approach them? And and the lads at that age appreciate honesty because as you get older, I think you certainly do, don't you? But at a young age, I think to a degree, you think you know a little bit better, like we touched on. And yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm going to admit now that I've got probably I got one one of them wrong. Yeah. Um, and out of the out of the sort of eight eight or so that that moved on. I definitely got one of them wrong because what he did is he he went back, stopped playing professional rugby league or academy rugby league, yeah. went back to I don't know whether I think I don't know I went think he went back to West Bank, okay. then ended up um, working his way through uh, to representative teams and ended up playing for England uh, at, at amateur level. Um, okay. So I was I got it wrong about him, yeah. um, and. You know, his dad was a big part of the club as well, and his dad sort of like went, "Well, I'm not, I'm not having anything to do with you, because you've told my son that he's not, he's not welcome here, and this, that, and the other." Um, so that was a, that was, I got that one wrong. Um, I'm not going to name him in case he listens to it and then comes around. That's me fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then the, there were other players. Um, there were other players as well um, that. I had to sit down and, and uh, I did it as a group with parents as well, and I explained those those um, those times where I've been told in the past that I wasn't wanted, um, and I think to a degree because they were all really really disappointed, but yeah. to a degree I think they accepted that because I was honest with them and, and I could sort of give them. Um, some experiences that I'd had, um, and I explained to them what how I'd how I'd done that and how I sort of got over it and all that. Yeah. But they've you know they've all you know I, I, I see one or two of them um, every so often. A couple of them ended up going playing at Ashton, yeah. uh, Ashton Burrs, right. but winning northwest counties premier division with ashton right. ashton a Burr, tough side, yeah, yeah yeah, oh, yeah. And, yeah. And, and you know um really really nice human beings so um yeah so when when you're in that in that chat mate and are i are i contact important here at that stage yeah. yeah so when you yeah so when you're seeing maybe not because you're still a kid at 16, whether people admit it or not, aren't you? You've, yeah, of course. You still don't really know what you want to do other than play rugby. Yeah. But yeah. when you're looking at mums and dads, dads and granddads, cur- whoever's yeah. the curer, yeah. do you half get the, sen- the sensation that maybe they understand as well and might not have had the goal just to say, listen, you might not be good enough for this level? Yeah, I, th- I think yeah. Th- th- there's defi- there was definitely an element of protection of their son. Yeah, absolutely. Trying to protect their son from this, um, the big bad world. Really, yeah, yeah, it's not nice being. It's not nice being told you can't do something that you enjoy doing. Mm. And they're trying to protect them, but then in the same breath, I think they understood. Um, yeah. they, they, they really understood that actually, you, you're not quite. You don't quite have that sort of X factor. 
you're not particularly quick or you're not particularly skillful or you're not particularly tough or whatever, whatever it might have been, they, they yeah. probably didn't have those attributes that would have helped them to play academy rugby. Yeah. Um, so I think I think most of the the parents understood that. The one or two did say they clearly didn't. Yeah. 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 I, you know, I, I accept what you're saying. Um, but they wanted to protect their son, which is, you yeah. know, I'd probably do the same thing. Yeah, of course you wouldn't. Just being nosy, really, my dear. Because I've heard it done in the past, like, for Woodsy, for instance, it was, um, did he go on, I think he done, like, try, uh, try pay as you play. Yeah. With all them, I think, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Is that, is that an avenue you, you potentially open for people? Yeah, we, I mean, there, there, there are a couple of lads that, that ended up doing that for yeah. for some of the witness academy teams that I coached and particularly when I coached the reserves for a couple of years that's that's what we did as well yeah. lads would just turn up and train on a uh, a couple of times a week and play at the weekend and get 75 quid for playing yeah. and you know nothing else now if they didn't play they didn't they didn't get anything but they still turned yeah. up to train but then you got some lads that were get were getting a little bit of a, a little bit of a contract money it wasn't a lot yeah, it was enough to cover, um, to cover probably the, the car insurance and the expenses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They they weren't going to buy. They weren't going to go out and buy a a brand new car with it. Um, yeah, but they would be able to put you know to run run a car and, and buy some decent clothes and you know go out with the mates when they when they yeah. come things like that. So it wasn't a lot of money, but you know right. um, the, the pay as you play stuff is. An opportunity more than anything else. Yeah, it's a shot window for them, isn't it? And, it is. Yeah. yeah. And do you are you allowed with the academy then to play how you want to play, or does it sort of filter from first team to academy to scholarship? Do you try and play the same way to a degree? Well, at the time it was Steve Mac had principles of play that he wanted us to implement, but then the framework I could tweak. I had, we, we, we kept the same, the, the calls were the same. So the, the, yeah. you know, the plays were the same, how we split the field up was the same. Um, but I didn't have to play exactly the same way as first team was playing. So first team, first team would have a particular, so, you know, that, that where I explained about they run from dummy half five yeah. times and kick it wasn't like that. You, you you weren't. It wasn't prescriptive like that. But stay had a framework. Um, yeah. He had a print. They had principles of play, and then he allowed me to develop the framework for the players. Because effectively, look, these 16, 17, 18 year old young men can't aren't yet experienced enough to do the same things that a 26, 27, 28 year old man can do. That's probably yeah. played 150 games at, at that level. They, they've got to have those experiences. So it was so quite watered down and it was a little bit more, uh, it was, um, I want to say it was, it wasn't that structured, but I'd get some of the lads who, who turned around to me and say, yeah, it was. It was. Yeah. was. You told <laughs> us to do this. If we didn't do it, you'd bark us. But, yeah. yeah. So. Well, the, the thing is, it's like we said, for people that might not understand rugby league, it's, you the set we talk about why like, where Blanche, he runs out, Bezit does, Smith does, that could well be an exit setting, you're 20, you're not getting anywhere, you're in a bit of bother. Yeah. You probably might even kick early. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's just, it, again, it's like you said, it's game now, so isn't it? It's game course, management. Yeah. And yeah, of course it is. Yeah. Getting everyone involved. Yeah. So when did you, which, so like you said before, was it... So that's for transition reasons before we move on. Sorry that calls are the same, yeah. splitting the field up are the same. Because yeah. the 13 back then, Dave, wasn't like the Arno, was the That's your third, true. Yeah. Your 13 was basically an extra prop in the middle third of the field. Effectively. Yeah. yeah. Right. Where now they do a bit of that and a bit of half back playing dot the Indian Cup. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, um, and, and that's where the game's changed and, and I yeah. no doubt you've seen it. So yeah. how was it going from coaching to being an analyst, was it which I've no doubt you prefer, I think what you prefer, but what was you going and was you thinking, oh, I've got to do that when I could be doing that? Or, yeah, and, and yeah, I yeah. know what you mean. It, 
Well, the 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 analysis for first team at Widnes when I first went to Widnes took second place. Okay, so you got your way a little bit. A, a, a little bit, yeah. Um, Steve still wanted stuff doing, yeah, but it wasn't as as in depth or as detailed as as I, I was doing at Wigan, yeah. Um, it was the coaching side of things that that I was given. Basically, I was given my opportunity to develop as a coach and to prove that I could do these things as a coach. Yeah. Um, so coaching the academy for for a couple of years, two three years. Uh, and then reserves coach for a couple of years. Um, that was brilliant. That was amazing. That was fantastic. And then when when Dennis Dennis arrived, he wanted me just to do just to work with first team, right? Um, which was again amazing because I was assistant assistant coach who also looked after analysis. But Dennis wanted more analysis doing. Okay. Um, so instead of me doing two sessions a week with the players. I might do half an hour in one session, right. uh, but the rest of the time was spent doing some uh, d- doing analysis with, with the team. Yeah, probably wasn't that, getting your thirst that hard a day, was it? It's yeah, just wetting the appetite more than giving you anything else on it. A- absolutely, yeah. and I so missed coaching um, and thinking about thinking about players day in day out. Um, you know, driving home from training and thinking. He's trained really well, so he's got to play at the weekend. I need to speak to him because he's he's struggling. I know that he's going to turn around to me and say that he's got um, a wedding on Friday night when we're playing on Saturday, and he wants yeah. to go to this wedding because it's his it's his brother's wedding, and this, and this that's one that's one specific example that I can remember. Yeah. I can remember the I can remember the conversation um, as though it was yesterday. Um, so there's all that all that sort of stuff that I. And was no longer thinking about. Yeah. I was thinking about my thirty minutes of of um, delivery with the first team, and then well, how we're playing, what can, what information I'm then feeding into the head coach, um, and then Super League happened. Yeah. So we got promoted to oh, we we got promoted to Super League. So it uh, it was that with bells on. So yeah, it, it changed quite a bit. I know, and that's when you were a sky regular, mate, wasn't it? Up in that gantry, freezing <laughs> your nuts off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, it was cold up there. It, it was cold up there, even in July, mate. Yeah. I, I'll tell you that for nothing. <laughs> there were a couple. There were a couple of occasions when we played a, a, a pre-season friendly, and it, the the snow was coming down sideways. Um, I couldn't feel my fingers. Um, I think at one at one point my, my, my laptop sort of packed in when as the coach is as Dennis is turning around to me, Dave, can you just show me that? And I'm like, I can't because my cup my, my bloody things packed in because it's minus two. You meant to have what? that open, Dave, not shaving in with it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that that was that was what um that was what that was that was like. So so there's a few things you touched on there that fans don't take into account, did he? So it's the human element of which we talked some before a little bit. Yeah. Is families, kids, yeah. partners, yeah. Yeah. weddings, Christmas, uh, yeah. Christmases, christenings, bar mitzvahs, bereavement. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It's yeah. all that you've got to take in and they don't understand why someone just might not be there for a few weeks. Yeah. I don't think you should have to release a statement to say something's happened, should you really? No. Not at and all. That, that's the world we're in, unfortunately. But they're the little things that we don't get when we're going like, why is our best six not on that field orchestrating? Yeah, we we all have a private life. Yeah. We all have the right to keep that private. Um so I know that 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 players understand that supporters want to know a little bit about them. And the, there is an engagement now, um, today. Even more so with you know using social media properly and what have you. Um, but when a player leaves and goes home, that's it. Leave him alone. That's yeah. his. That's his time with his family, with his friends, with his um, you know with his loved ones. Leave him alone. Don't, you know, 
don't give him any grief. Don't give him stick because he, he he missed half a dozen tackles at the weekend. He knows he's missed half a dozen tackles. Yeah. He knows more than the spectator does. Yeah. It matters more to him than it does to, to uh, everybody else that's watching that game because yeah. it's his career, it's his reputation, it's his livelihood, it's his life. Um, it's his part of uh, part of uh, who he is. He's his his identity. Um, they know when they've been great. They know when they haven't been great. It's like honesty, you know. Yeah. You need to look in the in the mirror and go, I've got fucked up. Sorry, apologies for the. Swear. No, I know it is. Yeah, yeah, I've stuffed up, and then I know how to get it better now because it's yeah. it, it's within me. Um, and there's no worse than backing an error with an error, is there? Because no. then you're all for try then. Exactly. And not only if you backed it up once, you've backed it up four or five times in front of yeah. five or six thousand people. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. The next minute, like you can't hear your own thoughts. He's getting booed every time he touched the ball. Or... Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That you know that that can have a detrimental pe- effect on on somebody's well being. Correct. Um, that the, the human beings first, and that's that's the thing that I've always thought. Um, yeah. I've learned that I should say that. Yeah. You know, it's the human first. It's the person first, and it's the player yeah. second. And I think that's when you get the best out of them as well, Dave, isn't it? When yeah. Yeah. you start to realise, mate, yeah. Definitely. Uh, before we, we come to the end of the spell at uh, Witness, mate, just a little thing on, could you ever have imagined how big the women's game's getting when we didn't yeah. have any women's teams, really? You used to have the odd girl growing up playing your team or yeah. play against it in a town team or whatever, but it was never yeah. like it was now, was it? It was... No, look, look, my, my sister played rugby league when she was a, when she was sort of 19, 20, 21 for a few years for a, a team um, in Warrington called The Port, right. um, which uh, it's, it's where David Lloyd Leisure Centre is now. That was the, yeah. the Port. Um, uh, well, at Crossfields, what they were called. Yeah, it's opposite, yeah. It was opposite from where Crossfields is now. Right. So it was the old, so The Port was or is a company and that was their playing field and they played there. So my, my, my sister played, but at the time, there, there was probably, there's probably about five or six clubs in around the Northwest and maybe about 10 clubs playing um, in Northwestern Yorkshire. She played for, she played for Lancashire. Um, it was, the, the, there was a couple of, couple of girls in front of her that ended up going, being selected for Great Britain who went on tour, I think in, Whenever it was, I can't remember. Yeah. But nowhere near the to the extent of the the game now, because the game now is without the girls getting paid and without the the the, the, the women getting paid, they're training as though that they're professionals. Yeah, you can like you said, you see it on the socials now because that's how yeah. life is now. Yeah, and and they, they literally do, don't they? they yeah, they base uh, themselves like. Just as yeah. much as anyone else. Yeah, I have so much admiration for them. Yeah. Um, because the games the, the game has, has come on leaps and bounds, and that the level of skill that that they have is phenomenal. Yeah. Um, because they don't play a lot of rugby as kids. So that when they get into the first team at, at you know at Widness or at Wigan or at York or Leeds, who are the, the two better teams, aren't the two best yeah. teams that um there's a there's a big big jump because they, they've not played sort of a hundred games before they become uh, a first team player. They might they might have played twenty before yeah. they become a first team player. But then the level of skill that, that that's shown in the game um, doesn't correlate with the the, the, the last games and the yeah, experience. Yeah. Um, and that that's the game. You know, being on it, you know, not having enough junior teams for kids to play in. Yeah, but they become, you know, become really good players when they when they get exposed to it at first team level. So yeah, it's good. So you spell it with us comes to an end, mate. Again, a little bit like when it was at Wigan. Was it mutual? Did you feel the time was right? Would you have stayed? How did it all come to a head? I, definitely, time was right. Yeah. Um, the the thing that tipped me was Kev Brown leaving. 
all oh, right, so you you were still, I forget how long you were with us really, but yeah, a bit so, of a crazy time that mate, wasn't it? Yeah, so Kev, Kev, Kev left, um, and I could see the writing on the wall because we got because the club got a quarter of a million quid for from Warrington for Kev, yeah, and we were told that we could decorate the um the players' room and buy a new TV with that money. Uh, so we so straight away I'm thinking my time here is not going to be for very long because of that. You're selling your asset and doing a room up. Yeah, and the, yeah. the club, you know, the the the, the club was um, becoming inward looking rather than what it was when Steve O'Connor first took over, which was really um, innovative, outward looking, um, wanted to to build the team, want, wanted to build a club be sustainable and so on. It yeah. became very inward. I don't know there's financial pressures because uh, for, for various reasons, but um, became quite inward looking. That was when I, I thought, that's me. I've probably done now. And that's when I started to, to look for, for other avenues and maybe going back working at the tax office full time or doing different things like that. Yeah. Um, and that's what I was, that's what I was thinking about. <laughs> But that's that winter. Um, I did some work with the Kangaroos in the 2016 Four Nations, so I, I did their performance analysis while they were over here. Um, bit bit of a name drop. Uh, yeah. Adrian Lamb, I, I sort of a big connection with him because when he stopped playing, I coached with him when he stopped playing at Wigan. We'd always kept in touch, and we'd done stuff. Uh, I'd done stuff before. He's assistant coach for the Kangaroos, um, and introduced me to um, to, to the, their setup. So I did some work with them, which was brilliant and invigorated, reinvigorated me. And I wanted to to then come back with everything that I'd learned from working with the Kangaroos and come back yeah. and, uh, and implement it at Witness. Just as we kicked the stuff in area. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but one of the training sessions. Um, th- this is this is so coincidental. Yeah. One of the training sessions that, that I'm, I'm at, uh, Sean Wayne turns up with Mark Bitcoin, who was the director of uh, performance for, for Wigan yeah. at the time. And I'm, I've known Wayne a long time because you know he lives. I'm, I'm pointing down the street here, but <laughs> he lives about half. We, we live about half a mile away from each other. Yeah, and we bump into each other in in um, in the place in where, where we live and, and what have you from time to time. And he and we were just chatting, um, and I I just said to him then I said, yeah, do you know what? <sighs> Things are pretty tough at witness at the minute. Blah blah blah. Do you didn't need think the any, there. <laughs> yeah, didn't yeah. think any more of it. Yeah, and then um, just forgot about it until I got up, um, until I got a. Um, I was contacted uh, and said, would you like to come and speak to us? Because um, we would like to um, invite you to come and work at at Wigan. So, you know, I couldn't say no. Yeah. I I found it so difficult, say, having that conversation with Dennis, and Dennis Betts, who was head coach at the time, because I've got so much respect for the ball. Um, Got a lot of stick as well, Dennis, didn't he? He did. Unnecessarily, because yeah. people didn't people didn't see the, oh. the 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 work that that Dennis put into that team, um, and the, the fact that he's a, is a really intelligent, caring human being, that people didn't people didn't see that, people didn't understand that, and I find that I find, more than anything else, I find it really difficult to call to Dennis and say, I, I, you know, we can want to speak to me, um, you want to offer me a job. And I'm, I think I'm going to take it um, because I think he was really disappointed. Um, he was really disappointed that I was leaving uh, and going looking, um, going looking for for a, a rival club. So uh, that was the hardest bit. But I knew I had to do it because otherwise, if I hadn't, if I didn't do it, I'd just jack in. I, I was I was ready to have a resignation anyway. So right, came at the right time. And is it? When you went again, it's like a second coming, mate. You walk through the doors. Is everything the same? Has it changed? So different. Yeah. So different. 
Um, the level of focus and detail was so much different, so much better than when I left the last time. Um, so did you leave when they were at Arrow, sorry? I, I, when I left in 2006, yeah. Wigan were... They weren't at Oral at the time. They were st- still based at, at DW Stadium. Was they? When I went back in 2017, they were based at Oral at the time. Yeah. Um, so when I went, so you know, I went into the, um, I went into the, the the training facility for the first time, and it was like, wow, this is amazing. Those look at all these amazing players. The you know Sean Wayne. Um, of no long time, I'm, I'm getting the opportunity to work with you again. Uh, I'm doing this from a hometown club, the club that I, you know, my dad took me watching my first game when I was seven. That was me. I, I was that. I, I'm, I'm happy. Um, completely different to what it was um, 11 years ago, but the, the game had moved on and the professionalism within the game had moved on Im- immeasurably um, since then. And just as enjoyable, mate, yeah. Even more so, you know. I joked, I joked after my first day, after my first day, um, can I come back tomorrow? It was a joke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm going home and I'm going, this is amazing, this is brilliant. They do this, they do this, they do this, they do this. Why Why did we not do that at Witness, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, and there's all these different, um, all these different things that, that made me sort of think, Actually, this is what professional. This is what a professional team that that wins things looks like. Elite, yeah, yeah. This is the you know this is the best team in the in the competition at, at the time. I, I sort of went I went sort of in March, about five weeks after they beat Cronulla in the World Club Championship, so they were world champions. So I got the opportunity, you know, the year before I worked with the, with the Kangaroos, world champions, and then I got to start working with Wigan, who were world champions, and, and that that you know. Um, in, incredible stuff. So it, it reinvigorated me and, and made me um, made me think a lot deeper about about my role and how I, how I could Im- implement stuff. Uh, um, that was just as an analyst. I say just yeah. as an analyst, but um, when he really wanted me to um, impart my knowledge um, as as best that I could. So yeah. Oh, levels, mate. Was that as well? To a degree, yeah, but. Yeah. Um, I, I I did a little bit of stuff with the scholarship just because I I love doing things like that. Um, yeah. the, the academy ran itself, um, okay. and I tried to implement stuff in the academy, but the, they had their own way of doing things, which was slightly yeah. different to first team. But they had their way, and they wanted to to, to keep it as it was, and um, yeah. that was fine because it, yeah. what I would want, what I wanted, would have taken more resource. Um, yeah. And, and and but the academy weren't funded for that, so that that's that was the only reason. And and there's a reason we're going are where they are and why they produce what they produce, and yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and yeah. you've witnessed that first, that mate. So the the mental side of things, then mate, the mental skills, which we've touched on the physical attributes, we've touched on the the, the skills that it takes to be honest and to take it on board or to not take it on board. But we've not spoke a lot about the mental side, funnily enough, which is a bit bizarre, but because your career's just gone like that all the way through. When did that become a part of you and your coaching and your analysis? I, st- I, I studied for a, a, part-time, de- a part-time psychology degree um, for maybe about, it took me about seven years to complete it. Um, yeah. Never thought I was going to complete it. Well, I I, I will admit to anybody, uh, my, my job at the minute is working at a university, but I will admit to anybody that was a crap student, um, and I wasn't that I wasn't that good at understanding what I needed to understand, or articulating it on paper. If that yeah. makes sense. You're a, yeah, you're more the doer than a, a yeah. side. Yeah, yeah. If, if I stood up in, in front of a group of people and explained something and try and explain it, that, that, then I think I can do that. But when writing yeah. down on a piece of paper in, for, in a ten thousand word dissertation, I found I found that really difficult and things like that. But anyway, can we press the space bar for so long, Dave? Got it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
so we, because I because I got that, and then I I sort of studied for um, a master's in elite performance. I wanted to sort of look at how can I help um, sub elite athletes to become elite regardless of what the sport is. So whether that's cricket, whether it's cycling, whether it's football, whether it's whether it's rugby league, that's the idea. Um, and, you know, there's bits that I've done already with, with clubs and with teams and I've tried to, and I've tried to implement things and what have you. Um, but it's really difficult for coaches not to override what you're doing or what you're trying to do because when when I go into a when I've been into an organization I've worked with a, with an athlete I've spoken about well I've asked them how how do they think how do they behave that, that, those are the two things that I, I try and break it down I, I don't start going on about psychology yeah uh, how are you thinking today what are you thinking about blah 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 how you behaving with other people? How you behaving with the, the the people that matter to you? How you behaving when you are approaching a competition? Um, and a coach, and the coaches have found that quite difficult. Um, so you work with a player, you work with a team, but then when you start working with a the coach, they find that quite difficult sometimes. I think. Um, so when I've tried to explain and implement some some principles and some some ideas then the coaches or the coaches have gone away and tried to implement that and been reasonably successful in some instances but in, in other instances it's it's just been well that's what i do anyway isn't it and yeah. bit of resistance because that because what i think what tends to happen what people tend to think is that you would ask ask somebody to come and help your players with mental skills and introducing them to mental skills if there's something wrong with their mental skills but it's not it's it's not a fix it's if you go if you go training at the wids on yeah. a thursday night and you, you practice catch and pass it's so that you can go and do a catch and pass on a saturday afternoon when you're playing yeah and it's exactly the same thing but what, it, what I'm doing is, or what the, the, the player might do is they might start, they might st start thinking about how am I going to perform at the weekend, but put it into practice during the week. How am I going to interact with my teammates? How am I going to speak to it? Uh, are we going to speak to each other? So there's little things like that that you think, well, actually that, that's, is that really what, what it's all about? And that's what I found with with some coaches is that my players are broke, fix them. Yeah. Uh, but, but when I don't go in and fix them, in inverted commas, yeah, that it's it it, it it feels a little bit unusual for them, and they think, well, well I can do that. So um, yeah, it, it's a challenge um, doing something like that, implementing something like that. Because it's you're taking a lot of people out of the comfort zone that they've probably been doing since they were seven. Yeah, and Aren't that's it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's just breaking the mold and thinking Absolutely. about it a little bit differently. Absolutely, yeah. And one of the finer things which I found mad is we we had an islander come and play at the woods or a couple of them, and you know when they don't know your name, yeah, they don't have to vocalise when they want the ball. Yeah, they can clap at you, they can yeah. whistle to you, they can. Yeah. It, and that's all part of what you're saying. It's just thinking differently of how to interact yeah. and yeah. perform that mini skill, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. So is is a return to sport something you'd like to do eventually or are you, are you more than happy where you're at? Well, um, over the last few last couple of years, I've been working with the England Wheelchair Rugby League team. Um, right. Delivering performance analysis, but also supporting the the head coach and sort of ment as in a sort of mentoring role, I suppose. Yeah. Um. He'll say that I talk too much, <laughs> um, which I probably do. Um, but that's what I've been doing over the last couple of years. So, 
it's World Cup, isn't it? At the minute, yeah. and we, uh, the England team starts, the England wheelchair team starts in a couple of weeks, and I'm so looking forward to that. But that's what sort of kept me involved a little bit because, but I'm only there, I only see them every six weeks. Yeah, and that's great. Um, but I do miss it. Right. Um, I did a little bit of coaching at Preston Grasshoppers. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I know. <laughs> I did a little bit of coaching at Preston Grasshoppers, um, but that sort of the politic, the politic behind the, the the club was was quite difficult to to sort of navigate a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I sort of I, I walked I walked away from that, but I, I still want to coach. So I'm uh, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little bit of coaching with Chevy Sharks this year, um, Good and get um, get my hands dirty. So I'm I'm, yeah. I'm looking forward to that. If somebody's watching this or listening to this and and, and is in need of a, of a head coach um, in um, in Championship or in League One, you're um, open to a chat, mate. I'm definitely up to something like that. I mean, I'm not, yeah. I'm not, not. I want to come and have a chat with you, John. But it's not what that's not what I've come on for. But if if the opportunity arose to go on uh, to go and do something like that, I'd love to. Yeah. Yeah. No, I did. You're someone, like I said, I've, I've knew of you for a long time, but it, just talking to you tonight, st- you're just pure stimulation, mate. That's what's just what you're after, the challenge of like, yeah. every day, isn't it? And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah you're yeah. not interested in feeling that anxiety on a Sunday, mate. You're thriving to the Monday morning to come yeah. or the yeah. evening. Yeah, no, I like yeah. that. So a couple of daft questions for you, Dave. Well, so did you ever get any pre-match superstitions? Um... No, not superstitions, but it was a root, the, the routines that I had. Uh, I had to sort of make sure that everything was right before I left, so to get to the get to the ground yeah. um, and what have you. But no, no, no superstitions. I'm I'm not superstitious at all. Right. So the the definition of the word I'm going to use is different for everybody. But the toughest player that you've coached and coached against, Sean O'Loughlin. Yeah. Because ultimate competitor, um, knew all the dark arts, um, incredibly skillful, was never ever ever phased by anything when he played. Um, we played against him, so when I was at Witness and he played yeah. for Wigan. I'm thinking. I hope he doesn't play, because he could, he could turn He's a match game. winner. Yeah. The match winner, exactly. Uh, then when I went went to Wigan and, and got the opportunity to work with him again for a few years before, uh, towards the end of his career, it was, you know, you're a you're a great player. You're at, you were a great player. You can't yeah. say that about a lot of players. So yeah, lockers. Fair enough, mate. Right? And your favourite away ground. Oh, I always like going. Um, I was like, I hate to go into Cass because the um, the, the changing rooms are rubbish. Yeah. Um, Wakefield I didn't like because you know change rooms were rubbish. There's a, there's a common theme here. <laughs> Headingley is the best uh, best rugby league ground. Because it, yeah. it's a standalone rugby league ground, so yeah, I it's guess a popular Hedin- one that. Yeah, yeah I guess Headingley. Although I've had a few bad experiences at Headingley, but I, I, that is um, that's my favourite um, my favourite away ground. I think. Right, mate. Say so you've had a few beers. You with you with the lads, and you're, you've had a good win. None of this sense in Hiltrugans. <laughs> the mics in your hand, mate, and, and what you're giving them. <laughs> Um, oh, I reckon some some um, depends what mood I'm in, I suppose. But I reckon karaoke is, is going to be some some Northern Soul stuff. Oh, good um, man! You know, sitting on the dock of the bay, or yeah. you, know, you know, you can yeah. only blast that out. There's no shuffle needed for that, is there? It's yeah. Just- Wing, yeah, wing casino all. stuff, yeah, yeah. that's um, I, I, I'd do that on karaoke, I reckon. Cool, man. So, if you're willing to, mate, 
a one to thirteen that you've coached. Ooh, this is hard. This, yeah. Um, and I've changed it left, right, and centre. Uh, you can double up if you need to, mate. Well, there's there's players that that I've um, I've picked out position. I suppose out of position. Yeah. Um, but the fullback Sam Tompkins. Yeah. Most intelligent player that I've I've I've, I've ever coached. Um, and and wildly misunderstood by fans. Do you know what? A good lad when he had him on, to be fair, and it got up a few times and he was sound. Yeah. yeah. He is. He's, you know, uh, he is a, 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 a great human being. And, and not a, I mean, more, every, pretty much, well, there's one or two that are a bit dodgy on, on this. <laughs> um, yeah. Let people but, guess who they are. Uh, yeah, I let people yeah. guess who they are. Uh, but, this is basically because you're a, you're a, you're a good human and you're also an, a, an amazing rugby league player. Um, yeah. I've picked Reese Hanbury on the wing because Sam Tompkins is the most intelligent player that I've ever worked with, and he's got to be at fullback. Yeah, Reese has to be in the team because he's such a freakishly talented player. Um, you think we've seen the best of him at fullback rather than in the halves? Definitely. He's yeah. broken field man, Reese, wasn't he? Absolutely, yeah. So yeah. ball ball carrier, um, quick, explosive, um, and when he when everything was right for him, because you know, he really really struggled being away from his family. Yeah. Um, when everything was right for him, he and he was on top of his game. He was unstoppable uh, from yeah. time to time. So yeah, but I love working with Reese. Uh, Pat Arvans, the other winger. Yeah. Um. Paddy would just get us a get us a win every carry, um, and such a great, a, a, you know, um, I used to have one to ones with him after every game, and he he'd, for the first few weeks he'd look at me going, "What what are you talking? What <laughs> what, what, what I, can't, I don't understand yeah. what's going on?" But after a bit, and he he loosened up and he, he opened up to me. It was great. Yeah. Really was fantastic play. Uh, fantastic. Do you know what I thought we were going to do with Pat? You know what we done with Willie? Yeah, right. Because because Pat does carry the ball with all of intent. Yeah, and defensively on the wing, you're vulnerable, aren't you? Not yeah, that it's yeah. his fault, but it, if yeah. if your centre has been beaten in trouble, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I thought if you could get bodies round him for him to back himself defensively, yeah. I think he could have done what Willie probably done. To be honest with you, just yeah. because of the way he carries the ball. Absolutely, yeah. And my next player is Willie Isa. All oh, right, okay. Um, I picked him at centre because if if I picked him in his in his position now, which is back row, yeah. I won't have I won't have space for for two players who I, I think are just incredible players. So yeah. I had to have Willie in there somewhere. So I've I've put him at centre, not yeah. the most gifted centre. He'll say that, but again. Um, an incredible human being, um, fantastic work ethic, um, tough, um, would run through brick walls. Um, when he was a little bit younger on the field, there was no talk. There was, you know, don't even think about talking to him on the field. Yeah. Just let him go out and play because He's not listening to anything that a coach or a physio or a strength or a, or a fitness coach is saying to him. He's just in the zone for, for 80 minutes. And I loved right. him for that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, Willie um, and Gary Connolly. I was really, really fortunate the first two years of my, my career at Wigan, um, Gasp was, play, uh, was playing the ultimate rugby league centre. Just everything about him, classy, uh, class, um, and um, he has some really good card tricks as well. <laughs> when, you're, when you're having a when you're having a beer, so yeah. just to challenge the brain, mate. Yeah. Just to challenge the brain a little bit, yeah. But yeah, again, you know, fantastic, incredible player. Uh, halves, uh, George Williams. Yeah, would you have him at six or seven, mate? Where would you play him? I'd, I'd play him at six. Yeah. I'd play him at six. Um, George can break a game. Everybody, so when England played last week, everyone was talking about Wellesby. Rightly so, because he played yeah. very, very well. 
Uh, everyone's talking about Dom Young because he scored a couple of tries. People talk about Herbie Farmworth. But, but basically, out of the 10 tries, George either created or scored seven of them. Um, Do you know what I like about George? That yeah. push he does. Yeah. You know when Sam jumped? Yeah, yeah. You can yeah. guarantee nine out of ten times, whether it's England or Warrington, he's yeah. really good at that push. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, um, great, you know, great character, great character. Um, yeah, love, love the guy. Love the guy. Yeah. Next one, um, you, you don't talk about legends that often, but this guy's a legend, Tommy Lulawai. Yeah. Um, I remember watching him one of his first games when he played at London Broncos as an 18-year-old. And I, and I joked with him because I, I showed him the clip uh, of when he was doing it. He he, he he ran on the field, right, we were, right, they were waiting to kick off. And I was watching this game because I think Wigan were playing London the week after. And he started doing sort of a moonwalk on the on the pitch. Right, He's only 18, I think, if you think about it. Yeah. And he was just in his own own little world, right? And I'm thinking, what is this kid doing? He's just going to get absolutely hammered. And then, like, 10 minutes into the game, he's just smashed, like, three blocks that are, like, three <laughs> times bigger than him. And we're like, wow, he's good. Yeah. Um, and then when you get up close and you t- and you, you get to know him as a person, you get to know him as a player and how much effort he puts in and his understanding of the game, what he's trying to do, um, uh, yeah. He's played for New Zealand more time more times than anybody else. Um, he, he's done it on both sides of the, the world. He's you know legend. Uh, yeah, there are two other legends in this in this thirteen as well. Who are a bit, you know super fortunate to work with. So um, front rower, Hep Cahill. Yeah, Hep's not a front rower. You know he's he's um, the, probably the archetypal uh, thirteen. Um, but Hep again. Um, incredibly, incredibly tough. Um, did everything at um, an incredible high intensity, uh, particularly in practice. He, he looked after himself so well, um, and then when he went out on the on the field, he had, he had fantastic life stories, um, which help you to understand why he did the things that he did and why he had that work ethic and, and, and so on. But what, a, what an incredible guy and an incredible player. So yeah. Hep's one of the front rowers. Gaz Hawk is the other one, although Gaz's best position is back row, but he, he can't get in this team as a back rower. Um, yeah. He's a talent, Gaz, one he? Yeah, what a player. Yeah. Um, what a player. Um, Sam Powell at nine. Now that might... You know, people might think, well, why, why are you picking Sam Powell at nine? I like Sam, mate. He is... Um, he's a young Mickey Mack, I think. Well, he's, again, you know, the vast majority of players that are in this team are, are, have got steel right through them, and, and Sam has. And I would talk to him after his game, uh, talk to him at half-time, talk to him uh, on a Monday morning after we'd, after we'd played, and... and I had to. I would reassure him and, and say, "I'd have seven of you in my team because you do everything. You do everything right. Um, your the, the skills that you that you to perform week in week out are consistently high level. Um, defensively, you're on it all of the time against people that are um, generally 10, 15 kilos heavier than you." And you're just a, a tough, tough guy. But again, another another one that is such a um such an incredible human being. So his views on the world are, are probably totally opposite to the views that I hold about the world, but we could discuss and debate it without falling out. Yeah. So you know, great, a great character. Um back rowers, Liam Farrell. All round, um, so we, we talk about talked about Gary Collar being the ultimate centre. Liam Farrell's almost the ultimate back rower. Um, yeah. Mister consistent, any Mister consistency, yeah. But probably gets a bit over for that actually, Dave, doesn't he? Yeah, because he does yeah. it well every week. Yeah, um, 
when people look at when people sort of compare him to other players that may be three or four inches taller or 10 kilos heavier or whatever, they don't appreciate how quick he is, how in, how intelligent as a, of a defender he is, um, how skilled he is, um, how hard he works yeah. um, in the gym, on the training paddock, and how well he looks after himself. So Faz is Liam Farrell. Um, Amazing. Um, Andy Farrell is the other back rower. Yeah. Um, so I talked about Tommy Lillard being a legend. Andy Farrell's a legend in my eyes. Um, yeah. Because he's been there and he's done it and he's done everything. And he carried a Wigan team for about three or four years when, when he was 21, 22, 23. And it, that takes some doing that. Yeah. Um, and, um Yeah. Great, but and I, I, I'm loving seeing him getting um, the success that he's been getting with Ireland over the last couple of years. So, um, top, 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 top human being as well. So, yeah. um, and, and Lewis Fall with Sean O'Loughlin. As I spoke about Lockers before being the toughest player, um, but I think just Lockers, he, he can just do everything. Yeah. So that's the one, move on to 13. No, I've had-